All right. Good evening, ladies, and thank you so very much for joining in this evening. Welcome to your first session of Agribusiness and Market Linkages, which will be led by Dr. Kamara Luizzi. Um, we are, before we start, I just want to go over a few housekeep housekeeping rules for those of you who have just joined. First of which, ladies, can you please, if joining the Zoom room, if you're just coming in, please make sure to mute your mics because it definitely causes a disruption during the presentation. Also, for those of you who have just joined, if you are using a shortened form of your name, an alias, or just your first name, can you please, please, please include your full name? It makes it so much easier for us to take attendance. So if you could please just rename yourselves, it's quite easy. Um, you can literally look at your name up above um, and then click the three dots and then click rename. So if you can try to do that so that we can take attendance, that would be much appreciated. Um, in the meantime, aside from this, I would like to take a moment to just present to you your amazing, amazing facilitator this evening, Dr. Kamara Luizzi. Give me one second. Dr. Kamara Luizzi currently resides in Nevis, where she used to be a livestock extension officer at the Department of Agriculture. She holds a BA in history from the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus, along with DVM from St. Matthew's School of Vet Veterinary Medicine, Grand Cayman. She's a former graduate teacher at the Charleston Secondary School. She was responsible for the Agriculture Science Department as well as teaching A-level communications and Caribbean studies. As a livestock, ladies, again, could you please mute your mics upon entering the Zoom room? As a livestock extension officer, her role is multifaceted. She provides technical support to livestock farmers along with procuring funding for various projects. Having been responsible for project applications for farming groups, Dr. Luizzi also assists with business plans as well as guidance for livestock business ventures. Dr. Luizzi is also the liaison officer for the Ross School of Veterinary Medicine Bovine Club. On occasion, she supports health teams when officers are not available. Along with assimilating relevant information from farmers and she records livestock production numbers. Facilitating workshops and educating farmers, she has harnessed her teaching skills so that farmers can maximize opportunities and have a better idea of agri-business practices. She also provides stray animal control and support. Dr. Luizzi is also responsible for the management of the Nevis Agriculture Department's Livestock Pound Facility. In 2016, she successfully began her own business called Perfect Pets, Pets. Sorry, so that's Perfect Pets that provides dog training and pet behavior and welfare consultations, emergency medical consultation and transportation, along with short and long-term pet sitting services. Part of her business involves a nonprofit aspect that facilitates rescues, adoptions, spay and neuter sponsorship, and medical assistance to pet owners in need. In her spare time, she conducts public speaking and interview training sessions for pageant participants, job seekers, and persons who want to improve their presentation skills. As you can see, Dr. Luizzi is a multifaceted individual, and I am so, so, so very glad that she will be leading you on this three-part journey this evening, um, focusing on agribusiness and market linkages. So in the meantime, I believe we are going to try to spotlight Dr. Luizzi, but again, in the meantime, just try to keep yourselves on mute and also to make sure I'm seeing some persons still have like their first names or like some aliases. Can you please, please, please try to change that so we can try to take attendance. So without further ado, ladies, I will introduce you to Dr. Kamara Luizzi. Trying to unmute. Okay. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, is everyone hearing me fine? Loud and clear. Okay. All right. Awesome. 
Okay, so um, just um, some background. If you hear um, barking or meowing in the background, that's just some of my children. <laughs> Bear with me, please. Um, you know, donkeys and monkeys passing, they get excited. So have some patience and try to make sure that they don't disturb too much. All right, so um, from last evening, um, um, welcome again. And um, just to give you guys a little bit of background about myself real quickly. Um, I am a veterinarian. I currently work with the Livestock Extension Unit with the Nevis Island Administration Agriculture Department. Um, one of my duties is to assist farmers in um, setting up livestock farmers, that is, in setting up um, businesses, um, writing up business plans, proposals, etc., as well as getting funding from um, grant groups such as FAO, Cardi. Right now, I have a group, um, FAN, um, the Food and Nutrition um, Organization through UE. I'm working with a group with that. Um, I also own my own um, pet service business. Um, and so that's basically my background. Um, I'm a former teacher, um, used to teach agriculture science, communication studies, and Caribbean studies. So I have a vast background on knowledge, right? Um, one second, one, one. Can... Ladies, in the meantime, while we are just waiting for Dr. Louise, there is something that I wanted you guys to ponder on. Um, I know we've been chatting quite about it, particularly for those that are based in Nevis about the Farmer Assistance Program. Um, essentially, what we are trying to do at Helen's Daughters is to create an umbrella like clusters or umbrella organizations in various um, Islands. So, for example, a cluster in Nevis or St. Kitts and so on. Um, so what we wanted to do is to try to group those of you that are interested to be under the umbrella of Helen's Daughters to approach um, the PS of Agriculture with regards to the Farmer Assistance Program. We can take this um, conversation over on WhatsApp. I will leave you back to Dr. Luizzi. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um... I think order has been restored. <laughs> um, okay, all right. So just a basic overview of what we're going to go through, right? Um, we're gonna go through agribusiness. And if some of you would have had a background in business, management, um, principles of business, accounting, even agriculture science and so on, some of the issues and some of the topics um, can be extrapolated to apply to um, agribusiness, right? And I am giving you an all around um, view of agribusiness, not just focusing on crops because um, too many times when persons hear agribusiness or agriculture entrepreneur, they affiliated with something crop based. Um, most of the, the time, um, backyard farmers and stuff like that. And you're going to see that there are a variety of areas and industries and um, businesses that um, are agriculture based that you can branch out into. Right. Some of them might be new to you and some of them might be familiar to you. Um, at this point in time, I would hope that um, some of you or most of you would have some sort of idea of what you want to do business wise, um, if not down now, later down the road, you know, um, and hopefully um, I can guide you through. So we're going to look at agribusiness aspects, marketing aspects and market linkages. And uh, you're gonna realize that marketing and market linkages are two, com two different things, two different aspects. So I'm gonna break them down for you. And you're gonna have assignments, especially at the end of this presentation, because I wa what I want you to do is to build as you go along um, and add the information to what you're learning so that at the end of everything, you have something, a template that you can follow. Okay, so Keithan, can you bring up the PowerPoint for me, please? 
Sure. Um, Linnell, are you on it? Yes. All right, so pull it up and pull to um, slide two. Seems like it's taking some time. Um, I will just okay, share I'll just my talk screen. To, I'll just, yeah, I'll just no, talk. I can, yeah. I can share my screen. Okay, all right. In the meantime, and Linnell, keep trying and let me know. All right, good. So we're gonna, the topics um, for this evening are gonna be basically um, the definition, examples, components, systems, models, and challenges. Okay, and I try to break it down as simple as possible. I know that there are persons who are visual um, and there are some videos in there also that I'm gonna ask them to play as we go along because you're gonna understand and get, you know, some ideas hopefully from them. All right, all right, so let's go to slide three. What is agribusiness, all right? An agribusiness, this is the economic activities derived from or connected to farm products. In other words, crop and livestock production, as well as processing, transportation, and distribution. So basically, the whole, the entire line, right? Agriculture and all of its economic, social, and demographic der um, derivatives, um, a sector that has an impact on practically all the sustainable development goals. So basically, um, when you're talking about sustainable development, we're talking about aspects of the economy that can continuously produce income, all right? Um, living here in St. Kitts and Nevis, you all would know that our import bill is extremely high, right? But that does not mean that we do not have the capacity to produce to the levels that we can in turn begin to export on a large scale, right? And um, working for agriculture department, I will tell you this, um, that when you're going into any aspect of agriculture or agri, or agri business, agriculture entrepreneurship, um, many people tend to want to rely on government. But what I tell people is just like any other business, for example, if you're going to be opening a restaurant or if you're going to be selling clothes or if you're going to um, have a, a, sh a shop on the corner um, selling food or, you know, drinks or whatever it is, you have to look at whatever endeavor you're doing as a business. So just like any other business, you can't be, oh, okay, um, I am going to start to raise pigs. Let me go to agriculture department and see what I could get from them um, in terms of building the, the, the pen and these kinds of things, right? You have to sit down, you have to go through and be like, okay, I wanna raise pigs. You have to have a plan, right? And look at it like any other business that you are going to go through. So the pigs would have a cost, the housing would have a cost, the feed would have a cost. Um, Medication would have a cost. Um, transportation would have a cost. All these things, and you're going to break it down, okay? Now, where I tell persons where they get assistance from the agriculture um, department is mostly in technical um, information in terms of how you go about doing those things to the best of your abilities so you can hit the ground running, right? Also, you would go to them to tap into or find out about um, grants, workshops, and, and other things that can uh, um, assist you in terms of building your knowledge and getting financial assistance, okay? So when you do it in that manner, right, you're basically self-reliant and you put things in place. You don't depend on agriculture department or another entity or whatever it is, just like any other business, you're going to run it accordingly, all right? Now, according to the FAO, over 
60% of the world's food needs are met by small farmers. And listening to, to your introductions last night, um, some of you would have had experience having your backyard gardens and everything else. Some of you are looking into doing that. Um, and some of you are interested in other things outside of, of, of um, farming, right? And this is good because it means that you're not just looking at what you're doing now, but you're looking at the future to see where you can go with it, right? And thus investing in agriculture is not only one of the most effective strategies to improve food security and promote sustainability, it is also essential to many countries' economic development. Okay? Now moving on, and this is a fun part for me because I like to see the difference um, in the different um, businesses that they have. And there are so many. And this list that I have on, on slide four is just a tip of the areas that you can explore when it comes to business models, right? Um, and you're going to see some, like I said, some of them you're going to be familiar with and some of them might be new to you. So let's look at the first one. I'm just going to pick out some of them random. Okay. Um, urban ag agriculture. Now the term urban is more in to do with, um, cities. So you would have urban areas, which is the cities, suburb areas, which would be the residential areas and so on. Now it's nothing, it's not anything that cannot be done here in terms of um, having areas close to the town areas or so on where persons can have easy access to maybe fruit orchards, um, herb gardens and, and, and those kinds of things. And later on, um, down further down, there's a small video that I have there that gives you an example of what and herb, what urban agriculture is, and gives you would give you some ideas of the benefits, not just of that setup, but what you can actually do with a farming system, whether it be crops or livestock or something else. Okay, natural oil processing, and this is something that you're seeing here now um, in the Federation, um, especially during the pandemic, a lot of persons. Um, we're doing YouTube schooling and getting YouTube educations and so on. And there are actually some persons who actually went, have gone further and got certified in learning how to process oils and use them in soap making, use them in um, shampoos, lotions, and so on. And, um, oh Lord, I forgot. One of the last um, cohort, the name um, Kamisha, yes, she spoke last night. Kamisha is one of those persons, right? Um, she did the, she was um, a part of the last um, cohort and she actually um, does the, makes the soaps and the lotions and so on. And from our cohort last year, um, she has gone on now to learn how to do things that I spoke about in terms of um, proposals and so on to the point we are now she has her products um, in one of the supermarkets, I think is Value Mart, okay? So that's an area you can look into. And um, there are persons who sell just the scented oils, the therapeutic oils, massage oils, etc. cetera, right? Um, nursery operation. Nursery operation, simple. You buy the seeds, you have these seedling trays, you propagate them, you produce the seedlings, you sell them to farmers simple as that. Um, most of the seedlings that are sold um, in the Federation come from the agriculture department, but persons can also get them from horticulturists, persons who sell um, ornamental plants, um, the Taiwanese embassy, those play, um, persons, right? Um, you can also, you can also, let me pick out another one here. Um, honey production and candle making, okay? So there are persons now going into bee production, honey production and so on, where they're getting the, the, the bee boxes and so on, and they are going into producing the honey. But the leftover product now, which is the wax, 
persons are now purchasing the wax from them and making bee wax candles, okay? There's a young lady, um, I think she's still in school, but she sells um, candles that she makes herself out of beeswax and soy and, and so on. And that is something that is also, um, you know, linked to agribusiness, okay? A florist. I mean, Valentine's Day is coming up, <laughs> right? Um, persons are gonna get their floral arrangements and so on. Person, they are, they, there's no reason why you can't grow the flowers yourself and make um, the, the arrangements yourself and sell them, okay? So that's an area. Spice production, okay? Um, whether it's you get the, the, the box and you ground them down, or you are selling the herbs such as the thyme and so on, and you pre-package them and you sell them in a, um, a package together. Organic farming and organic farming, I'm going to touch more on when we get to marketing because you need to understand the terms, what they mean and how you go about them because certain terms will help you assist you in your marketing, right? Um, agriculture equipment rental, right? There are persons these days, you see a lot of persons getting um, tractors and bulldozers and all that kind of stuff there. And there's good money to be made. Granted, the machinery itself, themselves cost um, a pretty penny, but the money can be made by, very quickly by the rental of these machines um, to clear ag um, land for agricultural purposes, right? And then um, agritourism. Right, um, agritourism right now, we are going more into that aspect where we have, um, oh gosh, my brain is not functioning, but the park in Sinkets and um, well, the, the new park in Nevis at some point in time will go along that route also, right? Where you have um, persons who, you know, will have like, how should I describe it? The, the plants and the, the herbs and everything else that would be quote unquote natural or local. And you have persons coming in learning about them accordingly, okay? And then I think I mentioned before the personal care um, products, right? The personal care products, um, which other persons like Kamisha, they are going into the soaps and so on. So there are various areas in agribusiness that you can um, explore. You don't have to be stagnant and think that, oh, okay, I am just you know going to stay in my backyard garden and grow my tomatoes and peppers and sell them, right? You can make ketchup, you can make condiments, um, you could make um, seasonings, bottled seasonings. You can make, um, I mean, guava cheese and tamarind balls. You see these things in the supermarket and, what, and whatever it is. So you don't have to stick to just the farming aspect. You can grow and you can produce. And all of that is part of agribusiness in terms of the areas that you can explore. All right. So now. Moving on, your first assignment. <laughs> and this is where you're going to, I'm gonna be calling on a few of you. You're gonna take, um, just brainstorm a bit. And I want you to think about at least three current businesses, agriculture affiliated businesses in the Federation, right? And I'm going to be calling on persons randomly, give you five minutes to come up with that. And you're going to think about what they contribute positively and what are or what is a negative, a possible negative impact of that business. Okay, so I'm giving you five minutes. Pause for a cause. Okay. And then I will be coming to you and calling on you randomly. And, and if you want to, you can raise your hands if you already come up with something and we can begin. So I like persons who are go-getters 
and we need this to be interactive. So, as much as possible, participate so that I don't have to call on too many persons. Okay, I think I see a uh, uh, hand was just going up. Yes, Melba. All right, come on, Melba, let's see what you have. Oh, we have tropical blossoms in Nevis. Um, mm -hmm. with, they, do, um, they do plant, they sell plants, different plants, mm -hmm. flowers and fruit trees. Mm -hmm. um, well, to me, one negative thing is that they're very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we are going to address so, that. <laughs> and, um, yes. So, you know, I don't know many people who sometimes would like to maybe buy a lime tree or, you know, or something like that, but it's, they're very expensive, so they may not do that because of the price. Yes. All right. Perfect. Yeah. I, I like that example. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to call on names. Okay, so Jacqueline. Hi, good evening, Jacqueline. Yes, the person who sells um, coconut water. Yes, bottled and cold. That is very good. I'm just reading out, right? The benefit is that it makes it easier for persons who want to um, drink coconut water. And we know the benefits of coconut water um, you know, it has potassium, a lot of electrolytes and so on. And however, Jacqueline, I, I want to ask you what is what you think. Okay, all right, you already came with it. <laughs> they don't always dispose of their coconut husk properly and then end up polluting the area. All right, yes, yes. So that is that is that is um a very good point to make, Jacqueline. And um the the okay Jacqueline so let me put you on the spot at this point in time what do you think they could do what's an alternative use for the husks um what do you think the um could be an alternative use for the the husks since they don't <laughs> okay so now I gave you something to think about <laughs> Melba, no, no, seriously, Melba, Melba just brought up a good point. She said smoke, um, yeah, well, Melba brought up smoke beef. Okay, so Jackie, um, coconut husk, right, can be used as a um, mulch, right? Yes, Joyce, thank you for that input. Um, used to go ornamentals as well. And the husk can be used to make paper, right? Um, and so on. Yeah, yes, yes, Jacqueline. So now this is what I like. Now we're having a conversation, <laughs> right? So now, you, now you're learning something, Jacqueline, right? So that's something for you to look into um, to the benefits of host, um, the use of host. And actually there was a young lady in the last cohort who actually was looking into um, doing just that um, using, um, materials such as coconut husk and banana leaves and so on to, to see how she could make like containers and, and, and different things like that, right? So, so yes, going through um, smoked meat, yes, Melba. Yes, that is actually agribusiness, <laughs> right? Um, brooms, yes, Carol, yes, the brooms, the, the person who makes brooms, yes? Yes, all of that because they're using the, 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 the parts, they could recycle the parts and so on, right? Yes, all right. Okay, good. I'm liking the input and the conversation. So you see now we are learning from each other. Awesome, very, very good. Okay, who else, anybody else has anything else to add um, in terms of, of um, an agribusiness?
see, 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 um, Jacqueline, you see, you got a whole list of things there, right? For, um, for the coconut husk. So, so when you, um, maybe when you're passing by the fellas that are selling the, the coconuts and everything else, you could have a little conversation with them, right? They could be, you learn something and then they could learn something from you from that. Okay, so awesome. Yes. Yes, I'm liking where this is going. So thank you guys for your contribution. Yes, you're, you're thinking you're in, on the right path in terms of thinking about, um, you know, different agribusinesses. And I'm sure if you think harder, you, you will come up with more, right? You could, you could, um, you will come up with a lot more. Right. So good, good. Very good. All right. So, um, this is just a quote that I, I found and I love. And her, this is a quote from Etherine Cousin. And she's a very well-known um, outspoken advocate um, for the development of, of and skill set of women in agriculture, right? And she says, ending gender inequity is not just the right thing to do. It is a smart thing to do because FAO tells us giving women farmers access to the resources they need would lift up to 150 million people out of hunger. Yes, Joyce. Yes, go ahead. Good night, Joyce. Right. Good Hi, night, night. night. I'm fine, thank you. Okay, I was just wanting to share on the slide before in terms of agribusiness. Yes. Um, those who could do confectionaries, and I can think of Val's Delight. Um, yes. The, I mean, um, yes. she has business that she uses natural products such as that apostrophes, and she uses yes. a lot of seeds products, meaning the guava, the guava cheese, and stuff like that, so the buy products. But yes. the negative thing about that is that having it in supply to have a constant market, because um, as I said, the foods are normally seasonal, so that mm -hmm. could be a little negative as well mm -hmm. such a thing. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And we are going to we are going to um address that further down when it comes to the challenges, right? We are going to, to look at that further down when we come to the challenges. But yes, um, so and that would be part of agro processing, right? And um agro processing is something that is is um, growing steadily in the Federation, not just from the government standpoint where they have their agro-processing plants where they produce um, the breadfruit chips and the, the drink sauces, the drink mixes and, and the guava cheese and stuff like that. When you go, just take a look when you go to the supermarket and, and look around in the seasoning aisles and the snack aisles and so on and see how many local products that you can pick up right and assess it and and think about um areas that you possibly you know not necessarily have to be anything you know major or that would take you know a heavy investment in terms of equipment and stuff like that but maybe you have a skill where you 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 make some awesome coconut cookies or coconut tarts right and um you you that's something that you are good at and everyone is raving about it and you decide okay well every week you make coconut tarts and, and whatever it is you're going to approach a supermarket and find out if perchance if you supply them um with maybe a couple of coconut tarts per week maybe on a friday or something like that and they sell them for you and you grow from there right and so you, you look at whatever skills you have or produce you have and see where can I go with what I have at this moment. So for example, what I mentioned, you have tomatoes growing in your garden, right? And I say, you can make ketchup, right? Um, you have uh, sweet peppers or whatever it is, or you're growing cabbage and so on. You're going to supermarkets these days, you see a lot of pre-done things like pre-done um, coleslaw and whatever it is, but those are done with the imported cabbages and carrots and whatever it is, right? 
you could do that yourself, plant your own carrots, plant your own um, cabbages and whatever it is, make your own pre um, coleslaw, whatever it is, package it according and, and approach, sell it out to your home or approach restaurants and whatever it is and say, look, I have this product, this is it, whatever it is, try it if you like it, you know, do up a proposal and so on. So you, you shouldn't just think about, okay, take the garden from the garden wash it and sell it which is okay which is perfectly fine but it's not all the time that you're going to be selling be able to sell or give away this stuff that you have and if you look around from since um the pandemic started that a lot of people are going into the backyard farming and so on which is good but then you also realize that um there are a lot of stalls popping up on the side of the road and persons trying to sell the extra stuff produced from their gardens. Now, what this does is creates a glut in the market for the roadside vendors, because honestly, we don't have the number of supermarkets available that is going to be enough to take supplies from everybody. Okay, that's just a given. So then you have to think outside of the box and say, okay, I have pumpkin. I am not, I have not sold all this pumpkin today. What am I going to do with it? Am I going to give it to um, a, a pig farmer, whatever it is, and tell him use it for pig feed or whatever it is? Or, or am I going to try and figure out, can I make something with this pumpkin, something else? Like, um, pumpkin um, bread or something that I can sell that is different from just the pumpkin so I don't waste it, but I can still make money off of it and contribute, okay? So you have to, you have to, to think forward, have forward thinking and not just think right now and right here. And that is what um, going into business is. You don't want to be stagnant. You want to think about what's the next step after you've gotten to a place where you're comfortable, where you've secured your niche in your market and everything else. And so you're looking further down the line. OK, and if you have things that you can develop and suppose, for example, um, you are the, the, the person selling the pumpkin at the side of the road and you'd be like, OK, I'm left back with this pumpkin. I'm going to make banana bread. Um, you make the banana bread and then you're selling it on the side and people really like the banana bread. And then you say, well, the banana bread selling better than the pumpkin. Okay. But you know that the pumpkin is also seasonal and whatever it is. So you decide, okay, I'm going to take some of the pumpkin. I'm going to preserve as much as possible. I'm still going to sell on this side of the road when I have, but when I don't have, I'm going to use this to make the pumpkin bread and therefore have another source of income. And then the pumpkin bread gets to the point where persons start to take orders from you and all this thing. And then you, 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 you have to have a developmental mindset right? And it's unfortunate that we in the region, and I'm going to say the region, um, are, how should I put it? Have a stuck mindset. And it's not that, um, like, for example, it's not that you, the persons, you guys who are participating in this program, which I would hope have a developmental, a highly motivated mindset, right? Are not going to want to explore ideas and so on. But too many times when you are venturing into something and you're doing the research and you start to discuss what's on your mind and what you want to do, you get a lot of naysayers, unfortunately, right? And there are many persons who have had brilliant ideas, who have started out, who picked up momentum, and then all of a sudden the momentum has um, fell, not because the of the the lack of potential of what they were doing but because they listened to the naysayers and and um they didn't focus on where they would like to see themselves and they focus on what other persons were telling them were going to happen okay and you can't afford for that um you can't afford for um, that to happen to you, especially after you've put in um, a financial investment, 
okay? And speaking from personal experience, speaking from personal experience, my first venture um, into my business, right? Um, it was not successful. And I found myself in debt because I, I listened to other persons instead of following the model. And, the, and even though it's like, what you call it? I lost, con I lost confidence in myself. And I was questioning myself, especially from a business aspect, right? And although I was knowledgeable, instead of me going and putting in the work and the research and to how to develop my model and everything else, I was listening to other persons. And so I went in half blind, not all blind, half blind, okay? And it caused me to put myself in a situation that I did not want to be in, right? And I had to get myself out. So to get myself out now, I had to now go back and do the work that I should have done initially in order to get myself to where I am now in terms of my business and the structure and how I operate, right? And it, it, it's, it, it's simple things that we don't think about that we, I'm gonna bring up um, later down that you're gonna be like, oh, okay, I didn't know this, right? And that's what I want to make you aware of, all right? Okay, so moving on to the next slide, um, components of agribusiness. So there are three main components of, um, agri um, of an agricultural business, right? That's the input sector, the production sector, the processing and manufacturing sector. Right now, if you are involved in agriculture, if you are going to be involved in agriculture, you can be involved in one aspect, in one sector, you can be involved in two sectors, or you can be involved in all three. Right? Depends on how motivated you are, depends on the ideas that you have, etc. So, let me go back to now. Um, let's see the hot sauces, okay? You know, Linus um, pointed out there's, yes, there's a lot of local hot sauces. So the, the persons who are involved in making the local hot sauces, for the most part, you can say that they are involved in every sector and they are involved in every area of agribusiness from the agricultural input, which is growing of the seasonings in their own backyard or on their um, farm plots, okay? The production sector, which is the actual agro-processing, the processing um, and everything else, the production, okay? And the input, and let me make a note here, right? The input sector also involves the, the finances, okay? the machinery, the land preparation, and all those things that take place before you actually produce the actual peppers and, 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 and seasonings that go into the hot sauces, which leads into the processing manufacturing sector, okay? And then you can be a part of all three. Now, some models, some models would even include the the um the sales sector okay the the um the sales sector so you can go from maybe the agricultural input and the production sector and jump over the processing sector directly into the sales sector the retail sector and basically that means for example if you are if you are putting the funds and, and, and the, the fertilizer and the water and all that kind of stuff there as the input, you produce your, your peppers and everything else. Instead of making um, the hot sauces, you bag them and you go directly to sale, okay? So some models have three, some have four, but for the most part, we look at the four. So I just want you to keep that in mind, all right? So simply put, the, those are the main components of um, the agriculture of, agri, of an agribusiness that you can look at. Now, there are persons, no, 
not ready yet. <laughs> there, are, there are persons um, who are in the different sectors. There are persons who are in the different sectors, but with different products, okay? Um, what do I mean by that? It means that um, I can be a farmer, I'm growing tomatoes, okay? Now, even though I am growing tomatoes, I am getting guavas from somebody else and making guava cheese, okay? So I'm in two different areas for two different products, okay? Or um, I am, let's see, I am making oils. I am making oils. Um, I'm selling them, right? So you're doing the agro processing and you're going straight to the retail. You can either um, also be a provider, okay? So what some persons do, and you'll find that this is very common, especially with the farm to table um, aspect, is that especially for the larger scale farms and so on, they have contracts or they have an agreement. I'm going to say agreement, and we're going to come to contracts and agreements later down with various supermarkets, restaurants, and so on. And Maki would have mentioned this, and Maki would be a perfect person to, to delve into this aspect also, but I'm just going to mention it. Um, we, uh, they have these contracts and so on for to produce a certain number of to to um, provide a certain amount of tomatoes or whatever product to the supermarket on a weekly basis um, for them to sell and uh, um, they sold at a flat rate or whatever it is and then the supermarket puts on the price etc whatever it is okay so you are you are producing you're in the production sector but then you're going straight to the retail sector or you're in the production sector and you're providing produce to the processing manufacturing sector, okay? Or like I said, you're involved in all aspects from all aspects and all sectors of the agribusiness. All right, moving on. So next, um, just a, 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 another quote that I thought was um, important that women have always been the backbone of a large majority of farming businesses and they have probably not had the recognition they deserve. <laughs> and this is um, more than true. And I think Keith Lynn can attest to this. Um, I don't know if she gave you her backstory about her grandmother, um, you know, doing a lot of the farm work and going to the market with this stuff, but then it was her grandfather that got the recognition. Right, and that is part of the reasons why she's so passionate about women being involved in agriculture. And there are very, there are a lot of similar stories. Um, we, are, if you talk to many of the female farmers, if the hucksters on the side of the road and so on, they will tell you they are not taken as seriously as the male farmers. Number one, they don't get the financial opportunities um, that are presented. Um, one one cohort member last time was telling me um, about her wanting to go to the bank and assisting with a business plan and so on. And she went initially and they didn't want to take her seriously because um, they didn't think that she had the what it takes to keep the business running and so on. And after some delving and everything else and reorganizing the information and all that stuff and doing the, the um, proposal and everything else in order to get the loan and stuff like that, she actually sent her husband. Now her husband doesn't know too much about the business because he has an injury and everything else. She does everything. So all that was there was from the wife and because it was the husband and whatever it is, you know, they got the loan. Okay, body, body, chummy, chummy, all that kind of stuff. And later down, you're going to realize that um, while there are a large percentage of female persons in, not female persons, but women in agriculture, too many times um, they are passed over 
um, not recognized, um, not looked towards in terms of skills building and um, workshops and stuff like that. And I find that particularly true when it comes to the livestock sector, sector right? But what I have recognized is that the women who have gone past the backyard farming stage um, and who are now move, who have now moved up one step further to the agro-processing phase, whether it's um, the making of the condiments, um, the seasonings, the, the candies, the cakes, and, and whatever it is, they've branched out into other areas. Like I said before, the naturopathic stuff, the oils, the shampoos, the soaps, and all those other stuff, okay? And what I want you to be aware of, what I want you to be aware of is that the more knowledge that you are armed with and the better organized you are, when it comes to getting funding, and we're gonna address that later down, it will be easier, okay? So just bear that in mind. So now we are looking at the agribusiness system. Slide, next slide. And here's an example of a model. Next slide, slide nine. Nine, nine, up, 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 <laughs> up. <laughs> yes, right there. Yes. Okay. So this basically is just a diagrammatics. Um, you know, this is just a diagram of all that I've said before, and for you to understand now how they are linked, because obviously, if you are going to start your farm, even a simple backyard farm, you're going to have a need input. You're going to need water. You're going to need fertilizer. Um, if, if, you're, if you're going organic, then you need to know the difference, you know, what you can use as fertilizer, what is organic, what is not organic. Um, you're going to need um, maybe weed products, um, somebody to come and till the soil for you. Um, make sure you have proper fencing. Um, <laughs> if you're living in a monkey prone area, donkey prone area, uh, area where livestock um, is going to come and hamper you, you have to make sure that your perimeter is, is fenced in properly and safe and secure, right? Um, you have to put something in terms of security against the, the, the thieves because predial larceny is a very big problem in agriculture, regardless of, of um, what area you're, you're focusing on. Predial larceny, which is the agricultural term for theft, right, is very big. Um, I, I, to, I like to tell people the story when I was going to school, um, I had a project to do as an intern in Jamaica um, with a funding agency. And the farmer that they were funding was starting out and improving on an existing poultry farm that he had. And it's, this is rural um, Jamaica, right? Um, and so they gave him basically everything he needed. So the building materials, the waters, the feeding, the, fee, um, the feeders, um, they, they gave him the chicks and all this kind of thing. Beautiful, beautiful setup. Um, small scale though, because it was on his property behind his house, um, a ways off and everything else, but it was a beautiful setup. He was looking forward to, you know, you know, selling eggs and all those kind of stuff and thing. And um, about three weeks after the final setup, um, the person, my, the, the coordinator called me and said, we have to go out and check the farmer because um, he called all in distress, said that someone stole his stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm thinking, you know, might have stolen some tools or something like that. And when we got there, unfortunately, they went with almost everything excluding 
the the wire the, the the wire fencing for the poultry farm. And when I mean everything, waters, feeders, birds, galvanized tools, everything. He went to sleep the night. He woke up. His poultry farm wasn't there anymore. Okay, and and <laughs> and that's exact that um. That's the worst I've ever seen it, but it is a big, big problem. And there are persons who have lost equipment um, that they use for agro-processing, such as bag sealers, um, juicers, and stuff like that from theft. So security is also something that you're going to um, want to look into, right? Um, in terms, and a lot of, uh, um, even livestock farmers these days, um, are looking into and putting in place security cameras and so on, right? Um, I've had cases here where farmers have gone and purchased um, wire and stuff like that, seal them up or lock them up and everything else and come back the next day, storeroom broken open, wire disappear and all that kind of stuff, okay? So this is something that you have to look into. And um, in the last cohort, we were discussing issues such as insurance, okay? And um, Telly is going to um, highlight this aspect in the financial literacy, but I'm just making note of it. Um, it's something that you need to look into, especially when you're purchasing equipment, okay? That you, 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 you um, look into if you can insure your business and the kind of business insurance if there's anything available and what your options are and all of this is part of your preparation for going into and this is part of the input okay so when you're looking at your finances and the, in your input and you're putting your budget together you can't just get up well you could you could i'm not saying you can't <laughs> but i would recommend <laughs> that before you look into any area that you're interested in, look at all the factors or as many factors that will or can affect you, okay? And finances, um, theft and all these things. And I'm gonna, um, they're gonna be further down in the challenges section, okay? Right, so moving on, moving on. Here's your assignment, right? I'm gonna give you a five minute little break. Um, five minutes should do it, five, five, about five minutes. Yes, and here's your assignment. We're gonna come back and we'll discuss again um, what you guys put together. Now, using the diagram that I just showed you, right? Construct a simple system using actual components. And I have an example here. So tomatoes, harvesting tomatoes and transportation and ketchup manufacturing, okay? You may include other aspects because all of them are intertwined. So basically um, the tomatoes would be the production, right? So you will realize I left out the input. Um, harvesting of tomatoes and transportation, that is an overlapping area. Ketchup manufacturing, which is the um, production aspect of it, okay? And you can also add the quote-unquote fourth aspect, which is the retail, okay? So think about that, come up with something. If you have um, an idea of, of an, um, that you have mulling around in your brain, you can also use that. In the meantime, while we're on this break, I'm gonna ask um, Linnell to play the video link um, that's the, uh, on the slide for you and pop that up so you guys can at least listen to it while you come up with your um, systems. Okay, no problem.
Just give me one second. Excuse me, we cannot hear. Oh, sorry about that. Focusing on the city ever since. How did he go about it? And how is he generating revenue? John. This is John. Some time ago, he took over the family farm. He's been focusing on the city ever since. How did he go about it? And how is he generating revenue? John first concentrated on his livestock. He now distinguishes himself with rare cowed pig breeds. And his orchard now contains different old Dutch apple varieties. City dwellers like to help picking in exchange for a part of the harvest. The first harvesting afternoons were organized last autumn. John has also started to grow vegetables. He sells his vegetables and fruits in his farm shop that's open a couple of days a week. His employees are people who have poor job prospects. Of course, John wants to keep his costs as low as possible. That's why he's using urban resources. He fertilizes his land with composted urban organic materials and his greenhouse is heated with residual heat. The farm has become an oasis, a refuge for urban dwellers. They enjoy being with the animals, find peace and quiet and experience the seasons. John is open to any ideas for his farm. The painting club wants to use it for workshops there are plans for a small cafe serving food. 
that he gets requests for children's parties. To realize this, a crowdfunding campaign has even been set up because more and more people feel involved with John's company. The Wageningen University and Research Center has described five revenue models for profitable urban agriculture. Just like John, you can combine elements from several revenue models. This will ensure that your urban agriculture initiative runs smoothly. Visit our website for more information on urban agriculture revenue models. All right, so everybody is ready? Are we ready? I'm Is here with the internet. All right. Okay. You can hear me now? Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry, the internet was just acting up again. Okay. All right. So, are we ready to submit what you have, what you came up with? Who's ready to go first? Carol's on these up. All right, let's see what you have. Oh, what, what I have is a simple one mm -hmm. where I would um, grow string beans mm -hmm. and my input would be the seedlings, water, and I want to use like organic fertilizer. There are lots of cows in the neighborhood, a pasture by me. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I would just um, grow them and, and bag them and sell them in the neighborhood. Okay, good. All right. So I like the fact that you mentioned um, the organic. Now, what do you think the organic means? What does uh, what does organic mean to you? Well, or organic mean that I would not use too much chemicals because it it costs more. Mm -hmm. Right. So, what well, in terms of the challenge? The challenge I have here is um the moisture. The air is really cool, mm -hmm. and uh, and um, I have slugs. Okay. And the and the African snail. Okay, so you would also be looking into some form of pesticide control. But the snail bait, like I don't, I don't know. The snail bait wasn't working, and salt. Mm -hmm. so it was salt, salt, and picking going out in the evening and picking them off. Physically removing them yourself. 
All yeah. right. Okay. So um, I'm going to address this, but I'm later down in the marketing area in terms of breaking down terms, right? But when you're using um, certain terms, such as organic, there are certain prerequisites that are expected um, in order for you to say that you're using organic because many times when you look at locally marketed um, products, you see the terms organic and natural being thrown around. But when you look at the requirements in order to use those um, terms on your products, you can get into some iffy legalities, okay? Um, the fortunate thing or unfortunate thing at this point in time is that we don't have oversight, okay? We don't have oversight. However, if we are to have full-scale oversight, there are certain things that you have to ensure in order to make sure that if you say it's organic, it is organic. So when you're looking at the definition of organic, it means the use of naturally produced substances in order to help you help your farm or help your animals or whatever it is, right? The lack of chemicals. Now, if we were to have oversight, for example, for the project that you, you just, um, the system that you just um, laid out, okay? And you say you're going to use the manure, you would have to find out if where the animals are grazing, okay? Because if the animals are grazing in areas that chemicals have been used in, and they are now producing that manure, it means that the manure is tainted. And therefore, even though you're using a natural product, right? It is not necessarily chemical free. You understand where I'm coming from? Right? And then now you have to look at if anyone else around you the area that you're planting your stuff, if any, if there are other farmers or even gardeners or persons around you that are using fertilizers and pesticides and so on that can seep down into the ground, into the water table, right? And therefore your plants, your, your, prep, your, um, your peas, sorry, can actually uptake these through the roots and affect the possibility of you saying that your your um, product is organic, okay? And I'm gonna go into more details about this um, later down when we come to the marketing aspect because you you and I'm I'm trying to let you all understand to the legality of certain things that if you're going to say your your product is this, it has to be this because even though we don't have um, government oversight, other persons could take up your product and say, okay, well, I go in and test it for myself and see what's going on here. And then you might find yourself in a bind. Okay. Um, just to see, um, I answer a question here by Jacqueline. Okay. Does the ministry, ministry or agriculture of the Bureau of Standards have a definition that they use for the terms organic and natural? Okay. <laughs> Very good question, Jacqueline. Um, I'm going to come back to the other um, um, systems, but let me just answer Jacqueline here. Um, <laughs> there are, yes, definitions, um, but like I said, there is no oversight. And um, you're going to, to get um, more details in that when um, Theo right, um, goes through her aspect with the food safety and everything else, um, she's going to, to, to highlight that more um, and go into more detail. But the issue here is oversight. So do they know? Yes. Um, do they have persons going around and checking and so on? Sometimes, 
<laughs> um, sometimes, um, sometimes the check levels and so on, um, and, 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 and stuff, but there's no person or persons that's going around. They have the labs to do the tests. I will tell you this. They do have the labs to do the tests, but they don't have the, the, the force, the labor force to go around and, and take and test the, 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 the products and the, the produce and so on for pesticide levels and, and um, fertilizer and all those kinds of stuff, which would qualify because organic, you have to be 95% chemical free, okay? And that is different from natural. Natural simply means you're getting it directly from the source, it's not processed, okay? And, uh, that is where now you have a lot of where you can get tied up because if you're looking at a lot of the agro-processors that they have here in the Federation and you're looking on the products and their labels, you see the terms organic and natural thrown around willy-nilly. Most of the time, most of the time, they mean natural, not organic, meaning that they get it directly from the source, the natural source, unprocessed, and they use it in their, their products and everything else. But there is some use somewhere of um, fertilizers, pesticides, weedicides, and so on. So it's very, yes, yes, Linus, very correct, correct, very ticklish, the organic definition, depending on where you live in the world, right? Because different um, areas have different percentages that you have to abide by. And if the inspectors go and see you have, and there's registration on all these things that you have to go through, which we don't have here yet. There's been talks about it, but unfortunately it hasn't come into play yet because you have to register, um, your farm has to get in, inspected, your products have to get inspected and so on in order for you to put that label on. Um, to the organic label. And if you have the organic label and it is found that um, chemicals are in your soil or antibiotics are in your meat um, and all these things, you lose that certification and you're not allowed to use the term organic. And if they do find you in breach of that, then you will be fined. Okay, so like I said, it has been discussed here in the Federation, but it has not been put in place as yet, but there are labs um, that can do the testing um, for the chemical levels and so on. And I think, well, for up here, um, you can make the request to have the levels tested. I don't know, however, how long the results come back, especially when you're dealing with perishable goods. It's really important to have that information from as soon as you, you, you harvest your goods before you sell them so that when you are saying they are what they are, they really are what they are. Okay. Right. So I hope that helps. Um, Jacqueline, I hope that information helps. Right. Okay. So let's go through. So Velmarie, we have plant and flowers, make floral arrangements, sell floral arrangements. Yes. That's a very good one. Okay. Cassava, grinding cassava, cassava. For, yes. And Trudy, that's a very good one that you brought up because right about now, as, um, well, I know for agro-processing um, agro processing Nevis, um, they're doing a lot of flowers, um, breadfruit flour, um, cassava flour, and sweet potato flour. And these are alternatives that can be used. So that's a very good um, example that you brought up. Okay. Um, sodas and coffee grounds. Okay, Melba. All right. Juliet, spinach, harvesting and bagging the spinach, selling to the community shops. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, um, or oh, that's for the slugs, the beer in a cup and put the hole in the ground. Thank you for that contribution, Melba. All right. Um, yes, guavas, harvesting, guava cheese can be bagged and sold. Yes. Sweet potato fries, this is Carice. Sweet potato fries, harvesting, transportation of sweet potatoes, sweet potato fries, manufacturing, bagging. Yes, that's a very good. Oh, that's very creative, Carice. I like that one. And, and you go to the supermarkets, you go to the supermarkets and you see the sweet potato fries in there. And I don't see why 
you can't or we can't produce our own sweet potatoes when um, sweet potatoes are, are very much available and you can get readily um, year round. So that's a very good one. Very good, Caris. Thank you. Right. Um, you're welcome, um, Carol. Yes. All right. Um, Lauren. Um, cultivation of fruits, coconut passion fruit, making puree into ice cream, ice lollies, and product selling, sell to supermarket. Yes, good. And I, I like this one here, Lauren, for the for the very fact that um, we realize that the place is getting hotter, climate change is affecting us every summer, every year it gets hotter and hotter right and persons are looking for ways to cool off and there are local ice creams actually in the supermarkets right i think there are about two that um i could um draw to mind very interesting um flavor combinations um spicy mango and all that kinds of stuff and there's nothing wrong with um doing more products so it does not necessarily have to be ice cream yeah the ice lollies the sherbet um frozen yogurts um selling the puree itself selling the, the the puree itself for persons to purchase and make their own products with their smoothies and stuff like that so i like the the, the way and the creativity of what you guys are, are coming up with it shows that you you guys are really thinking right um passion fruit um Fleming yes bananas harvesting processing patterning banana chips yes right and we do see banana chips um in the supermarkets right we do see banana chips we do see the planting chips and so on right um we have the passion fruit harvest the passion fruit remove the seeds make the syrup with the pulp to make instant juice very good yes um and and that is something that the agro processing um units in sinkets and in nevis they do and you can find the products in the supermarkets i don't see why um that so another person can can i don't see why other persons can tap into that market so very very good i like the contributions very well done ladies very well done i am I'm, I'm very happy with that okay so moving on um to slide 11. So let's discuss. Okay. So now that you've done your system. Sorry, my, 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 excuse, sorry, my, my internet kept dropping. I okay. was trying to write mine, but every time I write it, it dropped. I want to come back. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you could still put it. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. I was thinking dry lungs. Smoked uh -huh. chicken. <laughs> I go back you know what? Smoked chicken? <laughs> no, why are you laughing? It is a it is a valid no 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 do not laugh. You know okay. I'm going to tell you why not. No, I'm laugh. laughing because I put the smoked chicken earlier when you said what the coconut was. Oh. <laughs> yes, but no, that is that that you see, and this is what persons don't understand. Cooks, chefs, mm -hmm. they yeah. are involved. That is part of agribusiness, you know. Because somebody has to sell the chicken, right? Yes. Right? Somebody has to sell the chicken. And if you register that the what some of the supermarkets are doing now is that when they get the chicken or the, the, the beef or whatever it is, they pre-season them, they package them, and they put them in the freezer. Right? So if you if you know that you have a banging barbecue chicken or smoked chicken or something like that right yeah. and you can convince them maybe take samples for them to taste and so on to purchase from you so you have your little chicken coop or whatever it is and you could give it to them on a weekly basis right yeah. and you you have your chicken um coop you have your local chickens your your, your birds and so on you take them to the um abattoir you have them slaughtered clean and everything else you clean you slice them up you clean them you you season them you smoke them you package them you sell them you see yeah. so, so 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 that so that so that is that, that you you're on the right track when it comes to thinking right oh yeah so joyce so thank you joyce so yes yeah, so raising sheep the meat cuts selling the neighborhood to restaurants or supermarkets alternatives sell wholesale to butchers yes right and there are there are and this is something that i have been trying to encourage um, with a lot of livestock producers is to foster relationships 
with um, persons who sell food, not just um, the restaurants, but persons who would make goat water on a weekend, uh, black pudding and things like that, right? Because you, you, you are securing some, you're securing a market. You, you're sure of that sale when you make those agreements. But we, when we come down to um, marketing and the contracts and the legality of things, you're gonna understand that verbal, <laughs> you better make sure you have things in writing <laughs> because if you don't, you are going to get um, cut out of, 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 of some business and you have to make sure that you have covered your behind, that's saying so nicely, so that if anything happens, you can still garner some sort of income, even if it's not the maximum that you intended to at any point in time. Because when it comes to business, regardless of its agribusiness or any other business, um, things can change up very quickly, okay? All right, so now going back to let's discuss, right? What are the most important components of an agribusiness system based on these simple systems that you've just come up with? Who can, what, what, what do you think? What is your opinion now of what is the most important aspect or component of the agriculture, um, of an agriculture business on agri entrepreneurship? Any, any takers? The input sector. Mm -hmm. um, you want to specify anything specific, anything out of the input sector that would be specific? The input sector is all about um, like this stuff you have to put in a lot of uh, the production to start like the fine, you need finance, you need mm -hmm. that mass machinery and seeds and so on okay all right thank you very much and i'm happy you said that because that exact answer i'm looking at the first one that you said finance okay and too many times when persons are going into business and this is in general not just agribusiness they don't explore and go through the financial aspect as detailed as they should, okay? Um, many persons get caught off guard when they realize that the, the, the input is not, the, 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 how should I put it? The profit margin is not equal to what or more than what the input is. Now, starting out in any business, right? Some persons are going to hit the, the ground running and they're going to start to make a, a profit um, right off the bat, okay? Some persons are gonna have to struggle, um, reformulate, replan, restructure, and, and have some determination and, and try to figure out how things are going. Right, and Melba just brought up a very good point is that people don't like to ask, they like to go to the bank. Let me put it this way they like to go to the bank or they like to go to agriculture department, um, and so on to ask for, 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 my, for financial help, but they don't explore other areas and avenues that are out there that they can get financing from. And Melba pointed out one, investors, okay? Investors are very important if you are going to do something that you think has long-term longevity that you want to build into something bigger down the road, into a brand, okay? Um, if you are not into investors or persons having financial input, because the reason too, why persons might not want to be interested in having investors is because if you have an investor, the investor is going to be looking for a percentage, right? And persons are not willing to give up a percentage. Come, let's face it, for the majority of persons who are going into business or whatever it is, they are selfish. So asking for an investor to come in who is going to ask for a percentage so that they can make back a part or a portion of the investment is enough for them, okay? They want to 
basically carry the burden and they carry the burden but want to make if they make maximum they make maximum if they make a loss they make a loss but the the idea of an investor they don't want to look into it okay so and i'm going to bring up this um some some options when i'm talking about market linkages because then we are going to talk about um the areas and the avenues outside of commercial banks where you can look and tap into in order to get um grants and financing for businesses okay so thank you for bringing that up very much all right now next question if you were to develop an agribusiness which section would you be involved in and why so i realized uh, Okay, so so most of for the systems that you all have there, you, you all started from various aspects. So now, for the majority of you, would you prefer to focus on one sector or would you prefer to be involved in more than one sector or all the aspects of the business, basically from the input all the way down to the retail? Let's see, let's see, let's get an idea of where y'all are. One, one, one area, one sector, or more than one sector or all? Okay, Joyce is saying all. Okay, all. So am I, am I getting a general, Okay, rainy all, but gradually. Okay, very good, very good. That 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 is wise, Irania. I hope I'm pronouncing your name your name your name correctly. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, Joyce. Yeah, because you're primarily sole sole trader. All right. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. So general consensus is all. Now, if you are involved in all, what? No, no, being involved in all is in general positive. But what are positively, um, not positively, what are possible negative um, effects of you being involved in all the aspects, even if you are the sole um, trader or the sole provider? Anyone can give me an answer for that? Okay, yes. Yes. Any other any other input? Uh-huh. Yes. Mm-hmm. Good. So debt. Yes, debt failure is possible. Burnout. Very good, Zadia. Uh-huh. Yeah, yes, Joyce. Getting frustrated. Yes. And it, yes, Carice, it requires a lot of your time which in turn would lead to burnout, okay? So mm -hmm. it can be disheartening to know you're trying all and not getting where you want to go. Yes, reduce productivity. Yes, Louise, very good, okay? Yes, because the time, if you are going, uh, requires a lot of time, you're getting frustrated, you have burnout, then you're going to reduce your product productivity, especially if it's only you that's doing everything. Yes, frustration can lead to giving up. Yes, Juliet, I'm happy you brought that up because that is unfortunately one of the main reasons that persons just come out of their business and stop producing, right? Um, the frustration and the frustration can have different reasons. So yes, yes, Linus, yes. If you have another job, it is going to be difficult. So you have to make the decision whether you're going to bite the bullet and just focus on that and um, work with the risk, whether um, you're, you're successful or you fail, or you keep the two jobs and try to have a balance. Yes, okay, good. So basically you guys have brought up a lot of good points in terms of the negative aspects. So it means that it is aware, you, you guys are aware that even though you're saying you would like to be involved in all the areas, you are aware that there are negative um, aspects that you have to be 
mindful of and then you would have to learn to balance so that's why i liked um irania's um point of all but gradually right all but gradually because you have to pace yourself you have to know and find out and figure out how much you can handle right and if you can only handle up to a certain point there's nothing wrong with saying okay i'm going to stay here for this point in time and and focus on this for now until i get to another level or another area or more input and and stuff like that and then i'm going to move on to the next sector or the next aspect okay so this might be a case where if you are the farmer and you are producing the tomatoes right and and you are making the ketchup you might just have to say go to somebody and say okay you are a packager you whatever it is can you package these for me and label them or whatever it is and then take it to the retailer until such point okay and you might have to form relationships okay you might have to form relationships until things get along further off the ground because that is something also that many women face when they have a, a agricultural business because remember for the most part we are the main providers right we are the mothers we are the wives we are the caretakers of the elderly we have jobs and so on okay and so with all of those factors right plus having to branch out and go into a business there has to be a balance and you have to be realistic about what you can handle right and unfortunately um especially caribbean afro women women of african indian indo caribbean descent um so on we have um it can be good it can be bad um uh superwoman complex right um where we take on more than we are supposed to handle but we smile and we deal with it and unfortunately it leads to um other negative effects down the road it affects our health mental health physical health um finances and all these things okay so the mere fact that you're bringing up um the, the the these components that you have to be aware of if you're going to take on all right you first you have to know what you can be and what you can deal with so all i'm not saying no but you do it gradually and you find out what are the areas and there's nothing wrong with just focusing on one area if you realize that that's your niche and that's where you're, you're, you're most productive and that's where you can um do the best when it comes to that area and that aspect of the business okay now last question right um last question which areas of an agribusiness are women mostly involved in let's see how observant you guys are so here we go with your input again which areas of an agribusiness or agriculture entrepreneurship are women mostly involved in and why do you think okay anthea is saying food marketing yes mm -hmm. and why 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 and i i need a why when you're giving me these answers anyone else retail yes floral businesses all right agro-processing yes Any other contributors? Yes. Ah, oh, Carol. Carol, are you sure about that? Because it's less manual work? Are you sure about that, Carol? <laughs> re, re, rethink that and, 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 and come back to me. <laughs> Retail in the finished product. 
Yes, persons who sell produce in the market. Yes, right? Yes, Anthea, yes. Yeah, the household skills. Yes, because of the cooking and the other household skills, quote unquote, are easier for us. Yes, personal care. So that is also in the marketing tishari, yes. Right, good. So we have, yes. So all of the areas that you guys have highlighted are areas in agribusiness, or agriculture, entrepreneurship, where women are mostly involved in. And um, Joyce said it very clearly, the people skills, the better communication and the negotiation, right? Now, with all of this, yes, women are better money managers and better at record keeping, good, right? Yes, marketing, yeah, especially with the literate part and spreading the word. Yes, Linus, very good um, 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 comment. You're very good, very good input. That is very important, especially about the spreading the word, which comes back to the communication, because you know, they say women are always talking. It has its good parts. And on some, I will, I guess the men would, would disagree, but it really has its benefits when it comes to um, business, right? So you see here now that there's a, a disconnect. There's a disconnect because these areas that you guys have pointed out are the areas that are most prominent when it comes to agricultural businesses in general. However, it is the men, and I don't, I mean, I don't mean to sound sexist, but it's, it's, it's reality of the situation. It's the men that are, are given the, 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 the um, recognition, they're given the benefit of the doubt, it's easier for them to get financing and so on. But the women are, are the ones. And that's why I had to ask Carol if she's sure about less manual work, because when I go around, most of the farms, whether it's a crop farm or, well, not so much the livestock, but mostly crop farm. And when it comes to crop farming and when it comes to the agro-processing and when it comes to the huckstering on the side of the road, predominantly I see women, right? And that work is not easy and it's manual, right? I mean, Carol, you said you have to go out and, 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 and take off the slugs and so on with your hands and so on and things. I'm sure sometimes your back does be hurting you, right? So, and I don't mean to pick on you, but I just want you to, 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 to be aware that, you know, um, we don't give ourselves, as women, we don't give ourselves enough credit um, with the contributions that we make in society. And it's not because we are not aware, but because unfortunately, it is the conditioning. So it's, if it's something that I want you guys to leave with when all of this is over, is to have a bit more confidence um, if or when you're going to go off into other areas, um, whether it be agribusiness or another sort of business. Okay, moving on, we're almost there, we're almost there, we're almost there. So on slide 12, you're just going to see, um, and you're gonna get the slides there. Eh? So I'm not really going to um, spend too much time on this because I think we've gone through this piece by piece, um, various areas, right? So the agribusiness product, and we break it down into sections. We have crops and we have livestock, okay? And then we have perishable and we have long life for both of them. And for perishable, you see respiring and not respiring, and that's with crops. And perishable, respiring, those are those crops that you could store them um, on your counter, for a long time, for example, like potatoes, and the most that will happen is that they will sprout, okay? They won't really um, spoil. Non-respiring would be those that spoil, that um, go rotten after a point in time, um, tomatoes, cucumbers, stuff like that, right? Um, crops, long life. Long life basically means now that something is done to this crop in order for it to have a longer shelf life. And this most of the time has to do with some kind of processing, okay? So um, for example, let's look at the breadfruit. Um, you know, the breadfruit can be perishable, can be sold as a raw breadfruit straight, 
okay, it is non-respiring, meaning if you don't use it, it's going to spoil. However, if you want to make the breadfruit long life now, you turn it into another product, right? So you can either turn it into chips or you could turn it into flour, okay? Um, similarly, with the livestock, perishable, you know, the, the raw meat product, right? Fresh means as soon as the animal is killed, the meat is cut up, it goes straight from the animal to the kitchen, to the table. Chilled means that it's not frozen, it's just kept cold in the refrigerator. Um, some meats can last longer chilled than others, but others have to be frozen, okay? And then long life, once again, means that something is done to the meat um, to give it a longer shelf life. So um, most of the times when you're looking at this, some kind of chemical is added like sodium nitrates for preservation um, and, and other things that are added, salt, seasonings, um, curing, um, roasting, um, rotisserie, smoking, all these things that can um, can in all those other things that can prolong the life of that meat product. Okay, and moving on now, we're almost there. Second to the last slide, number 13. So there are different models. There are different models um, when it comes to agriculture um, business, right, and agribusiness. And uh, for each agribusiness, there are key stakeholders. So I've, I've broken, it's been broken down in the diagram um, right next door. So there's the financial services, the value chain suppliers, and the supporting services, okay? And one of these is going to be instrumental. Each one of these areas, right? Um, you're going to go into them and you're going to tap into a resource from one of them, right? And the models can be complex or they can be simple right? But you have to look at what your end goal is and then look to see what do you need in order for you to reach your end goal and so you know which area to go and tap into, okay? So for financial services, you have the banks, you have non-financial bank institutes, you have private investors, right? Um, cooperatives and associations, MFIs, um, which are agencies and so on, like um, CARICOM, FA1, and, and FAN, and UOE, and UNESCO, and all of these other organizations, right, that you can tap into based on the type of business you have and the type of model that you, you are going to be going into, right? And then, of course, suppliers. So input suppliers, you already know, um, fertilizers, um, persons who are going to clean the land, all those kind of stuff, farmers, producer groups. So you don't necessarily have to go to a particular farmer. You could go to a group of farmers, local traders and processors, processors, exporters, and wholesalers. Okay. And then supporting services, which is technical training. So you would look into getting your personal training or you tap into maybe a technical officer at the, your agriculture department, whether it be livestock um, extension or crop extension or somebody in aqua processing or fisheries or some area of that, um, like that. Business training, and I always recommend business training. I don't care if you already have a degree in business management, in management or whatever it is, it's always good to get a different aspect and a different idea and education is education. So even if you have a degree, right? Or if you have training, if an opportunity comes along for you to add on to that or be exposed to more information, always take advantage of that, whether it's a workshop, an online course, um, whatever it is, take advantage of that, okay? Specialized services and government certification and great support and um, this program, you know, when you graduate, you're going to get a certificate right and that will actually help you so this is actually this program in itself is part of one of the supporting services okay so just bear that in mind right moving forward 
Okay, so challenges. Obviously, going into any business, you are going to have challenges. Nothing is going to be easy. And you have to be aware of the risks. Okay? And these that I have listed are the most um, common. They have, based on what you're going to do, there are going to be other challenges, obviously. Um, but these are the most common challenges. Okay, so changes in the consumer taste or the market. All right, for example, you might have started out um, making guava cheese and all of a sudden everybody decides that guava cheese is unhealthy. It has too much sugar in it. Um, they're not gonna eat um, guava cheese or whatever it is. They got to get their summer body going and everything else. So there's a decline in the sale of the, your guava cheese, and then you realize that everything starts to slow. And so you have to, to, to try and figure out how are you going to combat or mitigate this change in consumer taste now that everybody else has gone healthier, right? And so you might say, okay, since they say that um, the sugar is too much sugar in guava cheese, let me try an, uh, um, a sweetener that is more is healthier, like stevia, or, or something like that, that is not going to add to the calorie um, content and, and whatever it is, and figure out what kind of formulation is going to taste better and are you going to get the same feel and taste and all these kind of things in order now to reset your business and meet the new changes in the, 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 the tastes of the consumer, okay? And obviously financial risk, there's always financial risk. And financial risk is the end all and be all because any other um, challenge that you have is going to affect your bottom line financially. So everything else that is here is obviously going to affect your, your financial baseline. So even though it's in the middle, that's usually the first challenge financial. And it's not just um, the other factors or the other challenges um, affecting your finances. Sometimes one of the biggest, not sometimes, predominantly one of the biggest challenges in, in, finance, in the financial aspect is actually getting finances. Okay, that's the major one. How do I get the money to start what I need to do? Do I have it in, do you have it in savings? Do you have it, um, do you have shares in something that you could tap into? Um, do you have a rich uncle that just died? <laughs> um, you know, you have to look into as many areas um, that, that, that you can to see. And that's why I, I, I broke down and showed you, especially with the financial services, um, you know, the, 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 the the groups that you have to look at or you can look at in order to see where you can access um, your financial input in order to either continue or to begin your, your endeavor, all right? And of course, we know naturally, natural disasters and then not just hurricanes and, and um, tsunamis and earthquakes and so on, disease outbreaks, and especially when we talk about disease outbreaks, disease outbreaks in the crops, um, disease outbreaks in the animal and even human, because we're in, the, in a pandemic, right? Even human disease outbreaks, which can be considered a natural disaster, can affect and can be a challenge, right? Climate change and climate change leads into the frequency of natural disasters such as hurricanes, um, droughts, rainy seasons, and so on, and can also cause increase um, disease outbreaks in both crops and livestock, okay? Public and government policies. Changes in public and government policies are policies that are not favorable to um, persons who want to start businesses or that are difficult or create difficulties or that can increase the financial inputs such as taxes and so on those things are challenges and this is something that you guys are going to have to look into especially if you're going to be importing um materials for your businesses you have to know 
um, things like um, getting a business license, registering for your business license, um, what you can bring in um, through customs and get concessions of duties off or whatever it is, um, percentages of, of, of how customs work and, and stuff like that, um, how the, your percentage of markups and, and stuff like that. Um, if you are producing from home, health inspections, um, how many health inspections and, and so on, um, food handlers, permits, um, you know, all these things you have to look into so that when you are functioning and doing your business, you don't get into too much trouble, number one. Number two, you can have a better idea of how much money it is going to cost you to import as opposed to trying to see if you can source materials locally or even having to get creative and, and, and make packaging and so on. Like for example, um, the food delivery service Farm Box Fresh that went and repurposed crates, not crates, pallets, sorry, to make the boxes that they make their delivery in instead of um, bringing in or ordering boxes or crates or whatever it is from outside. They just use that, okay? So you have to keep these things in mind. Obviously competition. And being a small island federation, um, as creative as you might be with your ideas that you're coming up with your businesses, once people see that your business is taking off, persons do not understand the struggle and the input and the research and all the things that you have had to do to get to where you are with your business, they're gonna want to start to copy it, okay? And the problem with, with, with competition, there's good competition and bad competition. Good competition is a persons who would come up and make you want to better yourself and improve based on what you see them doing, okay? And so it improves the market so that even though you have competition, you still have your client base and you're improving on your client base and the competitor also has their own client base. So even though you're competing and you have the same product, you might have little disparities, but it's not anything major that you can't combat, right? Bad competition, and I'm sure you see this a lot, is when someone has a good idea, um, has a business that is flourishing, persons see it, decide, okay, I want to do that too, and start copying it, but then they are not aware of what it takes. And so they start shortcutting and basically having a bad product that is the same as yours, but in competition. And so persons see that, and instead of saying, okay, I'm going to continue with you with your good product, they're gonna see the bad product, have a bad experience with that one, and then just cross all of y'all off the list one time and not want to have anything to do with you. And the whole product, the, the whole idea, the whole concept goes down the drain all because someone chose to copy you, but not do it in a judicious manner. And so it causes your business to have a bad reputation along with their business to have a bad reputation. And then both of you end up failing, okay? And then reduced resources, natural and man-made, okay? And climate change plays into this, especially when it comes to um, droughts affecting you know, how farms function, the seasonality of certain things. Um, if somebody used to make a certain packaging, but now they're gone out of business and you can't get that packaging. So you have to go and source another packaging, which might be more um, expensive and all these things, okay? So you have to look into to, to these areas and be wary of the challenges and look at the challenges that are going to be specific to your future endeavor and make sure that you have an idea of the risk and know what you're going to put in place to mitigate the risk if or when they do come about. Okay, last slide. Um, Linnell, um, can you play the video for me, please? And ladies, this is your homework. So take note of it um, and uh, 
your next session with me is going to be next week, Wednesday. So you have almost a full week to come up with this. And there's a reason why I'm giving you this assignment because um, we are going to build on it with aspects from um, the other um, sections, from the marketing section and from the uh, market linkage section. So take note of this homework. And Linnell, um, this is the last video. And then after, if anyone has any comments or questions, we can go over them. like as soon as you can talk, people are asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? For a while, you're sure. You'll be a police officer. Actually a teacher. Mm, maybe a supermodel. No, a superhero. Definitely a superhero. Then after that, you might not be so sure. It can be hard to choose because you're interested in lots of things. You don't want to tie yourself to one thing if it means you can't follow all your dreams. Let's see, what would be the perfect job? Well, to begin with, you'd like to enjoy it. What do they say? If you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. It would be great to have the chance to meet lots of different people from different walks of life and to contribute to a team effort. 
travel is good. A great job would involve some travel in Australia, and even overseas. It would definitely include technology. Using apps to meet challenges and control business elements would feel right. But you wouldn't be stuck behind a desk every day. No, there would definitely be the chance to work flexibly, inside and outside. Finally, and this is an important one, in the ideal job, you'll make a real difference. It's not trivial, it's critical, and people respect that. When you retire, you can look back and know you weren't just a spectator, you were frontline and connected. There are careers that tick all these boxes, and you might not have thought about them before. The diversity of rewarding careers available in agriculture and agribusiness is enormous. Let's run through just a handful. Of course there are farmers. They grow and produce food, and depending on the produce they cultivate, they can also hold other jobs, travel, pursue the arts, and be a part of their community. Scientists work on investigating a wide range of specialty areas, including finding out the best ways to grow tasty salmon, how to make juicy apples, how to feed people in developing countries, and how to reduce carbon emissions from cows. Perfect if you need to know how stuff works. Agronomists act as the liaison between farmers and researchers. They review research findings and use this knowledge to help recommend solutions. What a great role if you love bringing science to life meeting people and solving real problems. Horse breeders and handlers and stockmen and women get to indulge their passion for horses on a daily basis, mixing outside work with new technologies and building close and trusting relationships with their animals. Farm managers need a keen business mind and the ability to plan and predict. It's great if you enjoy strategy and leadership and it provides mental and physical challenges. Tradespeople, including mechanics and electricians, play a vital part in agribusiness. They can even enjoy the benefits of escaping the rat race, living in rural Australia, earning good money, and being a part of something bigger. Chefs, nutritionists, and food technicians all help to bring food from the farm to our plates. Perfect for foodies and health nuts. And more food for thought. All of these professions make an extraordinary contribution to the Australian way of life. So as it turns out, you can be a superhero. Well, almost. Okay, everyone. Um, that is the end of our session for tonight. Um, any questions, any queries, any comments before we leave? Everyone is good? Mm -hmm. Everyone is good? All right, Jacqueline, that's okay. Thank you for your input for the night. I hope you have in, um, enjoyed the rest of your evening and I hope you, you left with some useful information. See you next week. <laughs> okay, all right, so I think we're good to go then. All right, everyone, thank you for putting up with me this evening. Um, for my dogs in the background, <laughs> for your patience, <laughs> right? Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you for participating. Have a good week and see you next week. Don't forget your homework because we have some stuff to do. By the time you're done, I want to see some awesome stuff from you. All right? All right. All right. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. You should be getting this presentation tomorrow. Okay, thank you.